Kamai Kako. Welcome back to Energy Justice in Hawaii. I think we're on episode four now. Uh, joined today by three special guests to tell us a little bit about a uh, recent um, uh, development um, uh, in a project in West Maui in which uh, a community group secured um, uh, enforceable community benefits associated with a solar project um, uh, in Kahana. Um, I'm going to start with asking my three guests to introduce themselves since uh, some of them I'm just meeting for the first time today, and then we'll dive in a little bit to the content of the project. Um, uh, so Ryan, can you start us out? Can you introduce yourself uh, in a couple sentences? Sure, my name is uh, Ryan Hurley. Uh, I'm a local attorney here in Honolulu, and I practice mainly in the areas of uh, environmental law uh, with focus probably on utility and energy. Awesome. Uh, glad to have you, Bianca. Uh, you're up next. Yeah, much like Ryan, I'm Bianca Isaki. I have a private local practice in Honolulu, um, focusing on environmental and Hawaiian cultural rights. Awesome, so glad to have you. Uh, and last but not least, Lance, uh, can you give us a little couple sentence intro? Sure, um, my name's Lance Collins and uh, I'm an attorney based in Maui, uh, private practice. And um, I also have uh, worked for the West Maui Preservation Association or WAMPA for short um, for <clears throat> 16 years. And uh, I serve as their spokesperson and at times their um, representative. Awesome. It's uh, so great to be joined by the three of you today. Lots of uh, legal knowledge in the room, um, the Zoom room. Uh, so let's start with a little um, backup uh, rewind for folks who maybe are not as familiar with the Kahana Solar Project and WAMPA. Um, can one of you, maybe Lance, uh, give us a little intro um, about uh, what is Kahana Solar and how did the community, uh, how did Wampa and maybe the broader community first become aware of the project? Sure. So, um, so Wampa has been around since 2004. Actually, the people who founded it uh, started, uh, were involved in some community activities before 2004, but actually uh, incorporated in 2004. Uh, and so WAMP has been involved in a number of, of sort of hot button community issues related to development. Um, I think the one that folks maybe in Hawaii are most familiar with is that WAMP is one of the plaintiffs in the injection well lawsuit that ended up going to the uh, Hawaii Supreme Court, I mean, excuse me, the US Supreme Court um, uh, two years ago and uh, was decided against the County of Maui uh, last year. So, but with respect to the Kahana Solar Project, um, you know, the Wampa heard about it because people in the community had basically, some people had heard that uh, there was a new solar project uh, that was potentially going to be occurring on uh, former pineapple lands of Maui Land and Pine. Um, and a lot of people in the community were very unhappy with um, the uh, Kuia uh, solar project, which is um, in Lahaina Town and it's above the bypass. And basically, if you're in Lahaina Town and you look up, you see the L. And now you also see the Kuia solar farm. And um, I think people were very unhappy um, with the, the lack of community input and the way it was cited and basically total disregard for things like runoff um, and uh, visual stuff. So when <clears throat> word started spreading about this, uh, Wampa started looking into it. And then eventually the um, consultants, uh, the marketing consultants for uh, Interjects contacted a Wampa and uh, we set up a meeting with them. So that's how it started. And as people found out that we were uh, interested uh, in, in trying to help uh, address community concerns, various people from different parts of the community started communicating with Wampa about their concerns because you know many people are afraid to uh, speak out on a project that may possibly just go through regardless of what you say. So uh, people were careful, but th there were a lot of concerns and uh, Wampa tried to address as many as, as could be addressed. Awesome, that's a great background. Uh, I just uh, wanted to flag for, for those who might be hearing about it the first time, Interjects, I believe is the name of the solar 
developer that is proposing this project. And the project is around, I think I read eight megawatts of solar and like uh, 20 megawatt hours, or maybe it was 40 megawatt hours. I forgot that number for the battery. I so. think that's about, re that's reversed a little bit. So I think 20 megawatts of solar, um, a little bit larger than, than oh. maybe. And then I think, I forget what the exact numbers on the battery are. Okay. But something like eight megawatt hours, there's something like that. 80, maybe 80 megawatt. I, I'll have to look later. Ooh. Yeah, it was 80 megawatt hours. Great. Thanks for confirming that. Sorry for not looking that up uh, pre show. Um, so, so uh, folks were hearing about it, um, uh, uh, kind of drawing a parallel between a project, uh, a past project that had already been installed that didn't match community values and some of the same uh, issues were being raised to Interjects' kind of community outreach consultants around I'm hearing like a visual and maybe also some, some environmental benefit or environmental impacts. Were there any other community concerns that uh, you guys recall uh, Wampa or the broader community bringing up in those sort of early days? Well, I think the, one of the main things actually was, um, well, I mean, the overarching all of this, right, is if you have a large foreign corporation that's going to be profiting. So that there was concern about, you know, who is this new neighbor that's going to be in our community, that's going to be making money in our community and be um, in, uh, like physically there for at least 20 years. Um, so that was a concern, but it's, sorry. Um, as far as um, like other concerns, there was environmental around, especially runoff. I mean, the project is going to be placed on gulches uh, across several gulches. They call them tabletops because it's they're it's right across them, um, and those gulches go straight to the ocean. So it, um, that's going to have to be carefully monitored, and I, I think that's one of the things that um, was scrutinized. Also, fire because. There's, this area is fire prone. Um, specifically, this area has, I think, if, even in the last year or two years ago, there was a fire there. Um, there was concern about land rights because a lot of these parcels that were taken up by the previous, um, well, by um, the plantations going up through um, Maui Land and Pine, which is the new landowner for them, like there's there was concerns about whether or not the land rights were there. Um, um, I'm sure there's others I'm missing. Those are some of the main ones. Um, and I'm I'm curious at that stage. Well, actually, I'm not curious because I I listened to the snippets of the PUC hearing that uh, Ryan sent to me. So I have a, a sneak preview. But what was some of the what was the response that Wampa and the community was receiving from Interjects uh, with these concerns being raised? at that time well i think the i'm sorry i i think for interjects the um you know the the their focus was on getting this thing approved by the puc and so it there wasn't you know what wampa has even in the injection well case what wampa has has is used to is basically engaging in you know some sometimes difficult negotiations, but, uh, you, you know, negotiating with the developer or in the instance of the injection wells, the county um, to come up with solutions that everybody can live with, uh, you know, as, as best as possible. And uh, it just seemed that that was not part of um, Interjects' strategy at the time. And uh, un unfortunately, you, you know, those things can happen. And so we ended up in the in having to do a contested case because there was no negotiation. And uh, having to do a contested case, uh, what does that mean from Wampa's perspective? Uh, like, what, is, what does that look like for a community to uh, have a contested case? I guess maybe I'm, I'm talking specifically about like procedure. How does a community contest a case? Uh, is, it, is that in front of the PUC? Is there somewhere where you log uh, a complaint with the PUC? Oh, sure. So a contested case um, is, is actually a, it's a legal term of art that refers to um, an agency engaging a trial like um, process where it hears evidence and it basically weighs the evidence and makes legal determinations based on whatever the, the legal standards are. And so 
when Wampa intervened in the docket, um, it became like a party and the PUC identified what the legal issues were and basically signposted, if you get to, a, if you get to the, the hearing part of the contested case, this is what you have to prove. And so the process that we had basically went through uh, that. And um, so the contested case hearing was at the very end of it and you have to prepare. And of course, Wampa had two attorneys representing them, uh, Bianca and, and Ryan. So uh, communities you know, don't need to have an attorney to do a contested case, but it definitely makes things a lot easier. Great. Oh, yeah, Ryan, go ahead. I was just going to uh, ask no. you to chime in about that. I just wanted to add a point. I think that that highlights kind of one of the challenges with getting the community involved is if the developer is not really open and, and welcoming of the community, then the community has to take a, a much more drastic step. Um, you know, West Maui is very lucky that it has has uh, organizations like Wampa to, to represent it and, and, and hire people like us to do this. Um, but there is an expense to it. Um, and it's, I'm not sure it's totally necessary um, if there's other ways we could handle this. But um, I think right now, given the current process, um, I, I believe it was important for us to do that. And uh, it, it does just show one of the challenges is, is actually doing the contested case is, is takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of resources uh, and months and months of work. Um, and as we've seen in this case, you know, if we, we could have hopefully done this prior to a contested case and saved resources for everybody else. So, uh, you know, that's one of the challenges I think we hope to we kind of hope to show in this and, and encourage um, the utility and the commission to look at, at ways to better incorporate the community so that they don't have to result to a contested case all the time. That's a really, really good point. And I want to uh, touch on that. Uh, in a moment also, uh, but I would love for our audience to kind of get a sense, what was the result of uh, the contested case and the, and the PUC hearing once once that was formalized? Um, uh, what was the output of that? Well, it was kind of interesting. Uh, I haven't seen this before. At the end of the contested case, and perhaps because of the testimony, both of, um, I think of all the parties and especially the consumer advocate, which is a, um, government agency, part of the um, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, um, they, everybody noted that there are concerns, and we've said this even before we got to the contested case, that could be remediated through um, so mediation, through settling it, it, because nobody was specifically opposed to the entire project. It was just, there were details about it. Um, and so when the commission heard that message, um, they ordered us into mediation. So I, that was a novel step. In here. That is interesting. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about mediation. Um, well, I don't know if that's is that a secret thing that you can't tell us about, or are we allowed to know what mediation was like? Um, negotiation um, between the parties that's structured by a, we, we chose a mediator um, agreed upon by all the parties, the mediator talked to all the parties and um, kept trying to find compromises and um, points of weakness and strengths that um, and just talked everybody through and that's essentially I mean, we did it on zoom, <laughs> as everybody is doing now. And. Um, uh there was a, a result that the that the uh, mediator, I, I believe I read that it was a retired judge who helped mediate uh, between the two parties. Uh, what what were some of the outputs, the community benefits that uh, that uh, were decided upon and, and how does Wampa feel about that output? Perhaps someone else wants to talk about how um, Wampa feels about it. Good. We all feel good. <laughs> uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the 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 PUC you know the PUC proceeding is relatively limited in terms of what the PUC can and can't do. And so I think what Wampa was able to get through the uh, mediated settlement uh, was by far probably the best that it could have gotten uh, in the process. Um, and so, you know, for folks that aren't familiar with, with what Wampa got, um, the developer will be funding $55,000 a year of community benefits. Um, and then uh, they will pay at least 80% of their non-supervisory workforce 
um, the equivalent of a prevailing wage, which is basically a living wage. Uh, they'll commit to hiring locally first um, in from West Maui, then County of Maui, then State of Hawaii, and then only if they can't get their labor needs met locally, then they will uh, look elsewhere. And then also they'll commit to um, a decommissioning plan, which is very, very important uh, for the community. So, you know, I think those issues, which are things that the PUC can deal with, uh, are things that <clears throat> it should deal with in a more systematic way for those projects that the that you know uh meet the minimum requirements for a community to be okay with having these kinds of projects um, occur and so you know in the same way that the puc has decided as a matter of policy that these independent power purchases will occur through a competitive bidding framework they can just as easily require that the independent power producers commit to a hundred percent um, of its workforce being paid the prevailing equivalent of the prevailing wage. Um, it can also require a standardization of community benefits and, and so forth. And so I think Wampa's big hope is uh, with this settlement um, that this can guide both the Public Utilities Commission and also um, the utility in um, standardizing some of these uh, types of, of benefits and, and um, policy preferences so that it doesn't require community groups to have to hire attorneys and engage the contested case process. I mean, that's Wampa's big hope, I think. That makes a ton of sense. Um, and that, that feels like some, some amazing uh, points and uh, suggestions from the community that I think are, are wise business-wide. So that's amazing. Um, I'm, uh, oh, I also wanted to make a plug as a good think tech uh, Hawaii host. I get to ask most of the questions, but if anybody's listening now and wants to ask our uh, guest questions, they can email them to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. Uh, and if we get them in time, then I will ask them to our guests. But in the meantime, I get to keep asking the questions. Um, I'm curious about process. Like this is this was such a burdensome process, many hoops to go through for Wampa to get this end uh, result. And I totally agree that that those community benefits um, that you, that Wampa asked for um, should be a great starting point for all future projects. Like prevailing wage, what a wise idea. Um, uh, and I'm wondering for for specific projects that might have like a site specific community benefit or maybe a slight tweak on those things. Have you guys um, uh, through this experience, like uh, this is probably not on you guys, but do you see a better process forward for folks like Wampa who are going to be the neighbors of future projects to to uh, get this outcome without, you know, uh, being an intervener in a docket and going to a PUC hearing and having a mediation? Or do you think uh, this is kind of what we're signed up for for the next couple of decades of energy development? Ryan, I know you have thoughts. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I don't want to cut you off, Bianca, but yeah. Um, no, I, well, I, I, we've talked about this a lot lately. Um, so, and I will say, first of all, I think, and I know that the three of us have discussed this is, you know, we do think this is the best deal we could got for WAMP at the time. Um, that doesn't mean that this is a ceiling. We believe this is the floor going forward. I, I personally believe that 100% um, prevailing wages should be required um, for any project going forward. Um, as uh, as, as uh, Mr. Collins discussed in our hearing, you know, one of the big selling points about large utility scale, industrial scale solar was, was the jobs and the good paying jobs for that. So I, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, and, and the fact that we had to fight for something like that, I think it's telling of the times. Um, I do think there's a lot of things that can be done differently and that should be done differently. Um, and j just in terms of getting, and, and I won't go into the d details of, about all the different ways it could be done. And I know that Ali, you're working on, on different community ownership models. Um, I think there's a lot said to that. I think focusing on the distributed ownership, uh, distributed uh, resources first, um, personally, I'm a big fan of we really need to start to understand our load and our future loads, you know, as, as we were 10 million tourists in 2019 and, and are looking to exceed that in the coming years, 
I think we need to understand that that's going to be our driving load and that, that those tourists equal solar panels on agricultural lands, right? And so that in certain areas, we're going to have to understand that. Um, I don't have a short-term solution. I do think there's going to be a need for more intervention at the PUC. Um, and I hope it's not for the next couple of decades. I hope that that with some, some good intervention, I think that we're making a lot of uh, headway now um, in terms of I'm seeing, and I know you're aware of this, Ali, how, how the commission in uh, Hawaiian Electric is responding to some of the community benefit. Uh, the community um, renewable energy projects. I'm trying to get some more input there. I will say too, um, I think the speed, right, is we're seeing it from everywhere, both the, the utility and the commission, is this time is of the essence that we need to get this done yesterday. Um, and, and I think that does pose a challenge for, um, for us, uh, for community groups and, and the community in a whole. And then that might not lead to the best reality for us on the ground and how these projects have developed. So I think that always slowing down, taking your time, especially in the early procurement uh, phase, if we can get more community benefits prior to the procurement, I think that not community benefits, but more community input prior to the, to, to the procurement, that will go a long way. I know Bianca has some, some thoughts on this too. So please, Bianca, jump in. Oh, no, I just wanted you to go more into it. But I do like the language of this is a floor. And like Ali said, these are um, starting points. Because, I mean, you think about projects like Napua Makani and like no amount of community benefits was going to like remediate that. And so, yeah, I mean, community inputs. And I mean, but like taking a step back, like why is the onus always on the community to like show up you know, on a 10 on 10 a.m. on a Wednesday when they have to work to explain why a project's bad when it's pretty obvious that it's um, well you know that very very often it's just a way of like you know extracting um, extracting resources from an area by another corporation as opposed to keeping the benefits there and you know that's yeah, like like you guys have been saying that's where the crux of the issue is so we're just like finding band-aids at this point all the way you know settlement was good. <laughs> I'm going to add my other two cents in this. I, I, I really feel like at this phase, we're at the putting the fires out stage. Um, there's a lot of forward thinking, planning and discussing that we need to have. But the truth is, is that, that HECO has 15, 16, 17 extremely large renewable energy projects, 600 megawatts, 3000 plus acres of utility solar going in the ground in the next two years. And there's been very, very, very little community input. Add on top of that a layer of COVID-19. A lot of these public meetings have been held uh, via Zoom. I think one of the interesting things we, we talked about in, in, in the Kahana Solar Docket was the differences in how um, developers are holding community meetings online versus how the, the, the commission holds their community meetings online. Are they doing it in a way that's encouraging uh, community members to talk amongst themselves and be open and forthright? Or are they doing it in a way that limits kind of community input? That was one of the things I think we noticed. Um, and this is not solely on Kahana Solar. This is in a lot of the developers, I think, and the projects going forward. Um, but I kind of consider what we're doing right now is putting a fire out. We're trying to make sure that the community gets some decent benefits. They get the best that we can do for them. But I do think that, that in terms of long, you know, as we look to 2045, 100% renewable energy, this is going to be a massive, massive undertaking in, in terms of a number of number of projects and the size and the scope and the cost. Um, and, and I think that the, the, the community really needs to lead in this. I think all of that makes it a lot of sense. Um, and I also I loved your comment about like the speed and we need to move quickly. And so we're just we're moving quickly and you guys will we'll deal with you guys, you guys being community later. Like we're just focused on this. You're our second choice. Um, and I, I think one of my realizations about seeing projects that that had that perspective was that they are not going to go any faster than projects that might slow down uh, earlier. Um, although I wouldn't say that we've seen a lot of evidence of uh, the slowdown earlier yet, but hopefully they are seeing uh, projects like this, um, uh, seeing the output, the community benefits that uh, were uh, allocated through this project, and hopefully they take that and incorporate that early in their project design going forward, bumping that up to 100% prevailing wage. Um, Lance, do you have anything else that you wanted to add from the perspective of like uh, uh, iterating this process to be uh, 
maybe less cumbersome upon community groups like Wampa in the future? Yeah, well, I think one thing that I just wanted to follow up on on what um, what Ryan was saying is that, you know, uh, as I understand it, a number of, of independent power producers um, are making donations um, to nonprofit organizations and calling that community benefit or the response to their community outreach. And you know the the problem with it is that if it's their market, if the, if it's corporate marketing department deciding where to donate money, um, it's a very cynical way of looking at community benefit. So there really is no reason why the PUC can't say, look, projects that the community support has to have a community benefit component. It's going to be this percentage of gross revenue or something, and that it has to be you know the who gets that funding has to be determined by an independent third party, uh, whether it's something like the Hawaii Community Foundation or a separate nonprofit is, is set up. That, that you know, it's, it may be that would have to be decided after uh, further study by the, the PUC. But yeah, I just, there, there's a, a concern about, you know, that the, the fact that it has the effect of benefiting the community doesn't make it a community benefit with respect to the project if it's really just an extension of a developer's marketing. Um, and so that, you know, and so as you see in the Napua Makani uh, instance, well, that one's a little bit different because I don't think any community benefit <laughs> that could be given would have ameliorated the problem there. But I think in, in instances, you know, you can see from the Napua Makani where that kind of problem can occur because you don't have a community. I mean, even what they're saying is community benefit actually isn't going to the Kahuku community. It's going to another nearby community that basically is pitting neighboring communities against each other. So that's actually like the worst case scenario of what could happen. Um, but by degree, there's all, all sorts of less worst case scenarios that could occur uh, and in some ways undermine the, the purpose of having community benefit. So I think that that's one issue. The other being, you know, community outreach. The purpose of community outreach is to affect the proposed development. And if community outreach is really just trying to convince the community how great the project is without there being some change the other way, it's not really community outreach. Um, and that's, that's an issue that uh, Interjects is, has faced in some of their other projects in Maui. Um, as well, so. If I can add um, on to that. Oh, sorry, if uh, I can add on to that just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, okay. you got 30 seconds, go for it. <laughs> oh, um, okay, no, I just, well, for this for this settlement, I think it made sense, um, community benefits package made a lot of sense because like it's just gonna go into the grid to all of Maui, but whereas like, um, I mean, there's also the consideration of like, like making sure that you get the lowest rates um, but I think in this case, because the benefit, you know, it wasn't necessarily going to benefit the local community. That made that's one of the important reasons that you would want to have all of these clauses in there. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Um, thank you for adding that. And I'm sorry to rush you guys. This was an awesome conversation. Um, I'm so glad that you guys were able to join. And I, I hope that maybe we can have you back uh, in another couple of shows to talk about what the future of community benefits packages are in a, um, a new process. And maybe we could even talk about community ownership because that's a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, audience, on uh, our fourth episode of Energy Justice in Hawaii. I'm uh, Ali Andrews, your host. If you uh, think of anything that you want to come on the show and talk about energy justice wise, please let me know. We're always looking for guests. Um, thank you, Bianca, Ryan, and Lance, and uh, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.